We are in Psalm 110. I am looking at Psalms that Jesus quoted from since it was his favorite book of the Bible or that are messianic that predict in some way the coming of the Messiah. This is a messianic Psalm agreed upon by Jews and uh, Christians alike. Psalm 110. The topic, we are informed that when the Lord returns in his second coming, he will crush kings on the day of his wrath. The title of our message, Crush to Judgment. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I pray that we would be uh, made hopeful by the words of this psalm and that we would find strength in it today and in recalling it from time to time. That you would, in fact, Lord, minister to us in a really personal way. We pray in Jesus' name and those who agreed said, amen. There are, uh, they are the two most iconic images from the Second World War caught on film. You probably already know what they are. Fifty years after the picture was taken, the Associated Press wrote, and I quote, the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima was the world's most reproduced photograph. VJ, VJ Day in Times Square is a photograph by Alfred Eisenstadt that portrays a jubilant sailor embracing and kissing a stranger on Victory Over Japan Day. New York City's Times Square, August 14, 1945. The photographer wrote, I was walking through the crowds on VJ Day looking for pictures. I noticed a sailor coming my way. He was grabbing every female he could find and kissing them all, young girls and old ladies alike. <laughs> then I noticed the nurse standing in that enormous crowd. I focused on her, and just as I'd hoped, the sailor came along, grabbed the nurse, and bent down to kiss her. The two photographs capture a different type of victory in the war. It was victory on Iwo Jima, but the war would go on another six months. In Times Square, the victory was final. Now, as you'll see, Psalm 110 is about warfare and victory. It is set in a time of ongoing conflict. We read, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, indicating that there will be enemy activity ongoing. Its promise is final victory. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush the kings on the day of his wrath. This conflict, of course, is cosmic. It spans all the time from the creation of the earth and especially the creation of mankind until the revelation of Jesus Christ at his second coming. It is ongoing, and that means we on the earth are currently immersed in the conflict of this psalm. But here's what I want to get to eventually this morning. The psalm captures an iconic image. It's verse 7. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. What is it that we say about a picture? It's worth a thousand words. Well, this is the picture of cosmic victory that's worthy of 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of words. The iconic image of the kneeling, brook-drinking king of kings holding his head high should elicit hope and it should produce strength. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, the king drinking from the brook is your hope for tomorrow. And number two, the king drinking from the brook is your strength for today. Let's take a look at our hope for tomorrow. Uh, by the way, you should always read scripture in several different translations. Obviously, you are not a King James only crowd. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be here because we normally use the new King James. And it's a good translation, easy to teach from. But in your personal reading, you should check out several translations to get different nuances of meaning. Because you'll find that oftentimes the translators, though they are being accurate to the text that they're translating, have to make certain decisions about context and words and things like that. So today you'll notice I'm going to teach out of the New International Version, the NIV. Uh, it's just better in capturing the poetry and the flow of this psalm, in my humble opinion. So verse 1 of David, a psalm, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David is credited as the author, but the psalm is not about him or about his immediate kingdom on the earth. We are at once transported to the heavenlies where David's Lord has been welcomed by God to occupy the place of sovereign authority over the universe. The Lord is, of course, Jesus. The writer of Hebrews makes that clear when he applies Psalm 110 to Jesus saying in chapter one of Hebrews, 
After Jesus had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Uh, the book of Hebrews, of course, is written to a Hebrew uh, audience to show the superiority of Jesus Christ over the Levitical law, over the law of Moses. And it begins by talking about how Jesus is superior to the angels, and it quotes from Psalm 110 to establish that. The enemies of God are defeated. It happened at the cross upon which Jesus died. Because Jesus died in our place as our substitute, God can remain just while he justifies believing sinners. You might be familiar with this quote. It's credited to Charles Spurgeon. You stand before God as if you were Jesus, because Jesus stood before God as if he were you. I like that. Don't you like that? Encapsulates the, the, the work of the cross in a beautiful uh, statement. You and I stand before God as if we were Jesus, because Jesus stood before God as if he were us. That's how you get saved. There's a word of pause in verse one. It's the word until. It tells us that the defeated armies of, uh, or enemies rather of God are still at large, still resisting, still fomenting rebellion. These supernatural foes blind humans from God's truth. In one place, we're told that Satan holds them captive to do his will. It doesn't mean they're possessed. It just means that as non-believing individuals, they are part of the uh, cosmic battle that is waging against the Lord, and they hold Satan's worldview, even though they wouldn't say that. The last days in which we live are said to be full of the doctrines of demons, and that's for sure. If you're wondering why the conflict is ongoing, wondering why God doesn't end it, it's because he is long-suffering. He's not willing that anyone perish eternally, but rather that they would believe on Jesus and be justified. Some of you may be recently saved. Let's say you just got saved a year ago. What if God had come back in 2018? You'd be in the middle of the great tribulation at this point. Whether or not you would get saved during that time is sketchy. You certainly would be suffering uh, a lot more than wearing masks out in public. I mean, a lot of terrible things are going to happen. And so you would be thankful that God was long-suffering. And so we all need to have that thankfulness, even though it allows sin and all of its uh, corollaries to continue in our world. There's another important doctrinal message here in this verse. William McDonald uh, reminds us, and I quote, One day when Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees in Jerusalem, he asked them what they believed concerning the identity of the Messiah. From whom would the promised one be descended? They answered correctly that he would be the son of David. But Jesus showed them that according to Psalm 110, which they knew was messianic, the Messiah would be David's Lord. How could he be David's son and David's Lord at the same time? And how could David, the king, have someone who was his Lord on earth? The answer, of course, was that the Messiah would be both God and man. As God, he would be David's Lord. As man, he would be David's son. And Jesus himself, combining in his person both deity and humanity, was David's master and David's son. A beautiful, beautiful scriptural use uh, of, of these verses in order to show that Jesus was God come in human flesh and really to stump the Jews. Uh, there's nothing they could say about it, and that's why they hated Jesus and put him to death. They were more comfortable with their ritual and their self-righteousness than they were with uh, God's righteousness. Now, between verses 1 and 2, we have what H.A. Ironside called the great parentheses. It is the church age. It's a mystery revealed which extends from the ascension of Jesus to the second coming described in verse 2. And so... Uh, we're reading Psalm 110 with the knowledge of the New Testament. We know that there's this huge gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Uh, we're in that gap. We're in that parenthesis right now. And so in verse 2, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. We have the full revealing of these events. We know from the last book in the Bible that verse 2 is looking ahead to Jesus ruling from David's throne in Jerusalem. The entire reign lasts a thousand years, and that's why it's called the millennium. Millianum, uh, that's Latin for a thousand years. That's all the Latin I remember. And I don't remember it from the Catholic Church. I think I got it out of a book. I don't remember any of that. Anybody been to a Latin Mass? Remember the Latin Mass? E pluribus unum. And... 
Well, that's what it sounded like to me. And I was a, I was a devout little Catholic boy, and, and uh, it just it made no sense to speak in a foreign language. I mean, I used to sit there and I think, I know the priest can speak English. Why can't I hear? What's wrong with me? But anyway, Millianum, a thousand years. I, I'm only saying that because I don't want you to think I know anything about languages. I just, but that is the definition of millennium. Uh, of course, you're thinking of the Millennium Falcon. Uh, <laughs> different millennium. It's a glorious kingdom of God on earth. There's going to be children born who will not believe Jesus, even though they see him, even though they see us ruling with him in glorified bodies. People always say, oh, if I could just see Jesus. That's not true. They saw Jesus when he was on earth the first time. He did miracles so many that they couldn't fill the books of the world if you wrote them all down. He rose a man from the dead, and then they said, let's kill these two guys before this gets out of hand. Uh, and so same thing in the millennium. There will be non-believers who, against all observation, will rebel. They'll be led in rebellion by Satan, who gets set out of the abyss on his own recognizance and doesn't do well as a criminal. But their rebellion is easily overcome. Verse 3, your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. This probably depicts the second coming when the saints of the church age will return with Jesus. I suppose it could describe the final rebellion at the end of the millennium being crushed. Either way, what's interesting is how we are described. We are uh, arrayed in holy splendor. And that's exactly how the Revelation describes our uniform of the day as well. It says in chapter 19, the armies of heaven, that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. One commentator paraphrased the last words of verse 2. He says, as dew is born of its mother the morning, so thy army shall come to thee numerous, fresh, bright, and powerful. And so we're the Lord's army on that day, but we're going to be an unusual army in that in that future time, we never fight. We never engage any supernatural being. If you're training to wrestle with Beelzebub, uh, you know, with the, your luchador mask on and that kind of thing, that's not going to happen. I love my Pentecostal friends, and I thank them because they're busy with the devil all the time, and so that he leaves us alone. Well, no, that's true. You've been to Pentecostal churches. And again, I, there, I have nothing. I love my Pentecostal brothers and sisters, but they're always fighting the devil. Come on, devil. I'll take you right now. Jesus has rebuked you, the devil. I said, just let's tone it down a little bit. I don't want him to know where I am. You know, and you're like advertising on your van. Exorcist, come here. You know, so, but uh, anyway, uh, we don't do any fighting. Our weapon is holiness, our righteousness granted by grace. Human beings on the earth will see us and they will uh, see the glory of God in his plan to redeem and restore mankind. Our weaponry today is the same. Holiness and righteousness. We walk with the Lord in humility, surrender to him as living sacrifices, led and empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit. At the second coming, we follow a victorious Jesus and he conquers. Today, we follow a victorious Jesus and he conquers, but... Today, we follow his example in his first coming. We all want to start following him in his second coming. But we're here after his first coming. We're in between. Victory is our weakness being made strong by him to confound the wisdom of our enemies. Uh, that famous picture on Iwo Jima of the six individuals, three of them went on to die in the six-month period after that picture was taken. There was an ongoing battle. We are in an ongoing battle. Today, we are martyrs, not monarchs. Get that? The word martyr, here's another language skill that I have. The word martyr means witness. And uh, you ultimately think of a martyr as a person who gives their life for Jesus. But every Christian has given their life to Jesus. And in that sense, for Jesus. We just may not be killed for our faith the way some of our brothers and sisters were and are today. But we are martyrs today, not monarchs. A lot of people want to say, well, we're the king's kid. Well, I understand that. But we're going to come in that glory with Jesus a second time. In the meantime, you are a martyr. And that's how we have victory today. You're, you're those other three guys. <laughs> you know, you're, you're in the Iwo Jima picture. 
you're not in the VJ Day picture. That's the idea. The battle's going on. And of course, we're victorious in it because what's the worst thing that can happen to a person? Death. But we don't care about dying because we won't die a second time. We die only to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle said, I have a desire to be with Christ. Uh, but, you know, if he wants me to stay here, uh, praise the Lord, I'll serve him. And that's the attitude that we all need to have. Verse 4, the Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Mysterious Melchizedek appears in Genesis pretty much out of nowhere to Abraham. We learn of him that he was appointed by God to be the priest and king over Salem, which was ancient Jerusalem. So he's a real man who was a priest in Salem, and he was its king as well. And so there was a whole other priesthood than the one we read about in the law of Moses. This phrase, in the order of Melchizedek, is interpreted for us in Hebrews chapters 5 through 7. And if we were real Christians, we would read those right now. No, I'm just kidding. Let's turn there. No, let's not. There, you learn that the priesthood of Melchizedek is compared and contrasted with the Levitical priesthood established in the law of Moses. Under the law, you must be of the tribe of Levi, descended through Moses' brother Aaron, in order to be a priest. And there was never to be a priest king. And so the question is, well, then how can Jesus be a priest or a priest king? Since he doesn't come from Levi, he comes from Judah through David, and there aren't supposed to be any priest kings. And the answer is because of Melchizedek, because God had something going in those days that we don't know a lot about. And so Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, and he will be the final king priest. In the millennium, there's not going to be any separation between the secular and the spiritual. It's just going to be the rule of Jesus Christ. Verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. The last book of the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know that. This word revelation is apocalypse. Man, I can't believe all the language stuff I'm giving you today. Wow. I want you to go away and think, what a genius. He has a dictionary. But you know, that it's, it's the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And that word uh, means to tell or to reveal. The book reveals and unveils the few, Jesus Christ as he is today and as he will be for eternity. And so today people use the word apocalypse to talk about some disaster, the zombie apocalypse or some movie, you know, apocalypse now or whatever. But the apocalypse is really the revealing of Jesus Christ in his glory. And we're not talking about the end of anything except the era of sin and death. It's the beginning of something brand new. It's the beginning of creation as God desired it from the beginning as he restores and redeems mankind. Further, as I said, the world doesn't end. And so I guess if we had a sandwich board signed, it would have to be, uh, you know, instead of the end is near, we'd have to say the beginning is near. Now, wouldn't that, let's do that. Let's just look as crazy as possible. Let's go COVID hair. <laughs> Right? Man, did you have COVID hair or did you sneak around and get a haircut? I had COVID hair. Man, it was everywhere. I even posted a picture at one time, but it didn't do it justice. So let's go back and get COVID hair and go out with a sandwich board sign that says, the beginning is near. I bet people would ask. They're familiar with the end is near and they think you're crazy. But you get into this beginning is near and you've got, uh, you've got yourself something going on. I'm, I'm not serious, by the way. Or at least I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the seven-year great tribulation described in chapter 6 through 18 of the Revelation is a time in which God is pouring out his wrath against sin upon the whole earth. We call it the grace of wrath because each judgment is designed to draw mankind to salvation in Jesus. It isn't God throwing meteors at people because he's upset. It's one final global attempt to bring uh, hell doomed sinners into a relationship with him and to save the nation of Israel. And so it is severe evangelism. I hesitate to call it tough love because the judgments are so awful, but they all pale in comparison to a single soul being committed to an eternity of conscious punishment in the lake of fire. Verse six, he will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth, crush, crushing rulers 
Sounds a great deal like the Battle of Armageddon. Let me read it to you. Revelation 19. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. The armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse, and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Uh, probably it's that event, but it might be the final end of the millennium battle. Revelation 20, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from prison. He will go out to deceive the nations of the four corners of the earth and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. To that we say there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow, right? For Christians, but not until the second coming. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Second thing I want to see is in verse 7, the king drinking from the brook is your strength for today. As iconic images of the apocalypse go, the king drinking from a brook wouldn't come to mind. Doesn't seem exciting like Jesus breaking through the clouds in his great steed at his second coming with a blood-draped garment and his name that nobody knows. It almost seems out of place in Psalm 110. It's so calming. Of course, it isn't out of place. It's one of the powerful, iconic images the Holy Spirit wants us to see. It, it, it's an image that is, in his mind and from his way of thinking, perfect to capture victory. Verse 7, he will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. So how are we to take this? Well, as usual, commentators are split into different interpretations. Here are four of them. Some commentators see the suffering of Jesus uh, compared to a brook because of the abundance of them. And for support, they would cite any scripture in which partaking of suffering is, is expressed by drinking. And that does happen often in scripture. You drink the cup of, of the wrath of God or something like that. And so they see it as, as the sufferings of Jesus and his humility. Other commentators see it as Jesus' victory over Satan, sin, and death, mostly on the strength of the context of the previous six verses. Their argument is it's all about victory, so you wouldn't give back into Jesus' humiliation. But that's an argument that doesn't make much sense. Other commentators think the allusion is to the eagerness of a captain pursuing a routed army and pushing on in his conquest, comes across a brook and just takes a quick drink of it, hastening his pursuit of the enemy. Others see the joy and comfort Jesus has in the presence of God at his right hand, having finished the work of our salvation, and this drinking is uh, symbolic of being satisfied. I want to suggest to you that there may not be one correct interpretation, and there doesn't need to be. This verse isn't teaching any doctrine or any particular duty. Nothing to agree with in it. There's nothing to disagree in it. The very variety of possible interpretations by good interpreters tells us we have some liberty. The first six verses, those have obvious connections to specific biblical persons and events. They're not symbols. They're not allegories. 
They anticipate the persons and the events of the revelation. Now, I'm not saying this is an allegory either. Uh, I think it's something that really happens that the Holy Spirit captures for us, but we're not quite sure when and where it happens. Uh, but we do have this image of Jesus pausing somewhere along his journey to refresh himself. And the Holy Spirit holds it up for us to see Jesus in a unique snapshot. It's a way that we wouldn't have thought of seeing Jesus. It's, you know, uh, it's, it's just a picture that we, we, we wouldn't have, have understood any other way. It's for each of us to draw strength for the conflict that is all around us until we are with the Lord. And so we want to look at Jesus pausing, drinking, looking up in order to draw strength for today. So here's something the Lord ministered to me. Jesus stops to drink from a brook of running water. Running water is also called what in scripture? Living water, because it is moving and it takes care of the bacteria on cash that's fallen into it. Ooh, all those coin toss things, right? Oh man, the germs. I need living water, the refreshment of the indwelling Holy Spirit to fill me, to lead me. I can't simply go on my own sharing in his victory. Having begun in the spirit, I cannot make progress in my flesh. And so in one sense, Jesus pausing to drink along his journey, whether it's in his humiliation or in his victory, is a reminder that we need the filling and the refreshing and the draft of the Holy Spirit of God, every bit as much as Jesus did, maybe, well, obviously more than Jesus did, and that our life should be lived in the Spirit and in that power. And so while we can get excited about these other iconic images of of victory and the breaking through of the clouds, uh, what's going to get us through today is our dependence upon the Spirit. Remember Coca-Cola used to say it was the pause that refreshes? Anybody remember that slogan? Anybody... Younger than 65? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) So many things you guys don't know. What a terrible world in which we live. The pause that refreshes. And and I guess what I'm saying here is that we, we need to pause often and refresh. If the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, pauses to drink from living water, so must we. In the image of Jesus having his head lifted high, it turns out that there are a few verses in which He lifted his head toward heaven, or which he looked intently. He lifted his eyes before some of the miracles he performed, such as before feeding the multitudes and before raising Lazarus from the dead. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, we're told, when he prayed for his disciples before his crucifixion. One time he looked up and saw Zacchaeus high in a tree before inviting himself to a meal that would change that tax collector's life. Jesus still looks up and lifts his eyes. He does it for you and me. And so it reminds me that he is praying for me. I'm one of the disciples he was praying for, that he could do a miracle if it was in my best interest and that he can save me when I'm, pardon the expression, but out on a limb. Uh, And so those are just a few, I guess we would call those devotional thoughts. And so I think this is a picture for us to look at and to derive devotional insight from. I I always hate to use the word meditate. Eastern... People have ruined the word meditate for Christians. You realize that? When I say meditate, of course, some of you are young and you don't even know what I'm talking about. But (laughs) when I say meditate, everybody thinks Buddha, 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 or, you know, something like that. Emptying your mind with your fingers like this. I could never get into that because I can't get into a lotus position. (laughs) Even before I was a crooked old man, I could, I just, how do you do that? And I said, you know, it's just, it's not worth it. To be in con- to, it's not worth sitting like that to empty my mind and open it up to whatever evil influence is out there. And so, but there is a proper Christian meditation. It is filling yourself, not emptying yourself, filling yourself with the word of God. And so I would invite you to take this verse because it really is, it's an iconic image for us to determine some things about the Lord. And it's for you and I. Think about it. It can bring you strength for the battles in the parenthesis of the church age when sharing in the sufferings of Jesus is our mandate. Remember, we are martyrs, not monarchs. We will be monarchs one day, but not today.